Northern Ireland, a small step to a giant adventure. Book your next giant adventure at discovernorthernireland.com. Okay, this is Minister Simon Coveney, Minister for Foreign Affairs. I'm Vincent Kearney, a Northern Editor for RT, and this is a, a FILA uh, debate. Okay, so Minister, first of all, uh, who is Simon Coveney? If you, if you had a word or a phrase to describe yourself, what would it be? God, I'm not sure I'd recognise him in the street if I saw him, but... Uh... No, look, I mean, I'm, I'm a family person. Uh, I'm someone who's passionate about public life and politics. I'm someone who's grown up in, a, uh, uh, in an extremely supportive family. Um, I'm someone who's been privileged to travel all around the world. Um, um, I'm someone who's been in school and university in different places in, in terms of uh, the UK and Ireland. Uh, and I'm someone who is very motivated by what I do. And if, if that changes, I'll be changing career. Um, but um, at the moment, uh, I'm a Minister for Foreign Affairs and a Minister for Defence in the Irish government. Um, and I am, uh, as you would expect, uh, deeply embedded in the thought process around the future for this island um, uh, and all of the issues around that, from Brexit to the protocol, uh, to North-South cooperation, uh, to how Ireland is seen both at home and abroad, uh, North and South. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm about trying to protect relationships that have been very damaged uh, in recent years because of some of the stresses and strains of, of politics, not only in Northern Ireland, but also between Dublin and London, uh, that has impacted on, I think, polarising opinion and politics in Northern Ireland in a very corrosive way. Um, so for me, um, perhaps the most important part of my job as I see it is uh, how do we think about the future and how do we take on board people's fears, anxiety, ambitions? Uh, how do we speak honestly and openly to each other without offending each other? Um, and, you know, as, a, as someone who's a nationalist who believes that that perspective in Northern Ireland needs to be able to speak honestly and openly without being criticized or branded as something that they're not, but also as somebody who wants to understand unionism uh, better all of the time and understand their, their fears and hang-ups and so on. Um, so, you know, it's been a, uh, a really fascinating number of years. I've worked with, with four secretaries of state, you know, starting with James Brokenshire, then Karen Bradley, then Julian Smith, uh, and now, of course, uh, Brandon Lewis, and they're all very different characters. Um, but my job is to build a relationship uh, with the British government and also, of course, um, ensure that people who live in Northern Ireland know that a government in Dublin cares about them and their future uh, and our collective future on the island. In terms of how you got into politics, um, you won a by-election after your father yeah died quite tragically. Can you just talk us through just first of all what, what happened to your father and, and the impact it had on you and your siblings at the time? Yeah, well, look, I, I, I'm not sure whether people would be too interested in this, but I, I entered politics under a hugely sort of an emotional wave, if you like, because um, I was involved with um, some of my younger brothers and a younger sister in, uh, in this adventure and charity project of sailing a boat around the world um, 30,000 miles, um, two years, to try and raise a million euros for a charity that we were all passionate about at the time, which was the Chernobyl Children's Project. And I had been to Belarus and to, to see the work that they do. And while we were in the Galapagos Islands, in the Pacific, having crossed the Atlantic, um, ironically, where life began, um, uh, my, my father drowned in Cork Harbour. Um, um, totally unexpectedly uh, and so we we heard about that through a um, through a message on the boat we didn't have a sat phone we had a um, we had an email system um, and yeah so I, I I traveled in a small island called San Cristobal that only had a group of phones in the middle of the island and rang home to get some pretty devastating news um, and so we came home as a family I was I was the eldest at the time on the boat at 25 um, and we came home, of course, to, uh, to a very tragic funeral. Um, and when something like that happens, and a lot of people listening to this 
will have had similar moments in their life when really everything changes uh, and you're forced to think very fundamentally around your responsibilities in life and and how you follow them. Um, And so that was a moment for all of us. And for me, um, um, mainly driven by family concerns initially, uh, but then um, uh, increasingly political asks. A lot of people were asking whether I would consider running in a by-election uh, after the funeral was over and we were all trying to essentially recalibrate our lives uh, because we ha- I'm in a family of six brothers and a sister. Um, my father would have been a very dominant figure in the family. Uh, and even though we've all successful careers in our own right now, um, his loss was a sort of a a major watershed moment uh, in terms of the family and how everybody reacted to that. And um, I made a decision to to enter politics. I was very green and inexperienced at the time, to be quite honest with you, I'm not quite sure that I knew really what I was getting into for. Um, I was lucky I got elected in the by-election, not because of who I am, but because of who my father was and this, the sympathy factor that um, that drove that, that vote. But I've never regretted it, I have to say. Uh, And uh, while the others went back and finished that project uh, in terms of sailing sailing the uh, the boat around the world and raising actually just under a million euros, uh, I got involved in a different kind of adventure, um, which which ultimately has taken me to where I am today and have obviously fought many elections since then. And before your father's death, you know, had you considered a career in politics? I mean, your father was a a cabinet minister, a a Fine Gael, government. Uh, or yeah, were you really sort of honouring his memory? Were you following in his footsteps? I, I mean, I would say that people often talk about my family as a political dynasty, which is complete nonsense. Like, my father was a businessman primarily. Um, luckily for all of us, a very successful one. Um, he got involved in politics, but was really only involved in politics for seven or eight years. Um, you know, he won a seat, lost a seat, won a seat and lost a seat uh, during those sort of very turbulent years in the 80s. Um, and then came back in the 90s for a, for a relatively short period and became a government minister at that point. But he was a government minister for a very short period of time, in truth. Um, but for me, and for a number of my brothers in particular, we've always been very political, uh, always been very opinionated. Um, uh, and But we were always sort of given the advice, and it was something that we intended to take, that, look, politics was something you do but don't rely on as your main source of income. Um, And so the plan for a number of us would be to think about politics, whether it was actually being a politician or being involved in trying to facilitate change through various different uh, careers. But certainly I would have been focused on trying to earn my own way and living and then look at politics, uh, having proven myself in another area. But sometimes life, as people will know, changes everything and you're forced with a, into prioritizing and making choices. And I did. And as I say, have been very lucky since then that, that people have chosen to re-elect me at, at multiple, in multiple elections, whether it was a European election, uh, obviously general elections and in a, in a local election for a while as well, because I was, I was very conscious of the fact that I came at, into politics from nowhere. And so there was a view, I'm sure, among some that this, this guy sort of got it easy and didn't really, you, you, you know, work around in the uh, in the grassroots of politics to get the support needed. So I, I was conscious of that and I stood for local elections as well as being a TD for a while uh, to sort of prove that I could do the local stuff as well as as well as the national stuff. You say they're getting it easy, but it was far from easy in, in one sense. In your life in politics, you're, obviously we hear you on the airways a lot. Uh, you talk a lot. Some would say you talk for Ireland. Yeah. Uh, well, I try but, to talk for Ireland. That is my job. But, but, Sometimes I talk too much, that's true. But, it gets but, me into trouble. But that wasn't always the case. I mean, you, you had to overcome a very serious speech impediment in your younger days. And, and was yeah. getting into political life, was that part of the motivation for doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, when I was, when I was younger, um, I mean, when I was in school, in secondary school, I was in boarding school uh, for, for virtually all of that time. I did have a very bad speech impediment. I had a very bad stutter or stammer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I really couldn't read out loud for, for a number of those years, uh, which is why I find, found languages quite difficult, in particular 
Gaelga, Irish, um, because I found it difficult to, to speak it. And uh, likewise with French and German and, and other languages. So um, it also impacted on my ability to be able to, to debate in school. I, I was always interested, I was very interested in sport, still am, but I was also interested in, in debates uh, in, within school and between schools and so on. And, you know, that was a, that was a challenge for me. Uh, and uh, I can often remember in, in school when, you know, when the teacher would ask people to read one after the other, you know, I would be reading, but I would literally break pencils under the desk trying to get words out just out of frustration. And I'm one of the lucky ones because I managed to grow out of it. I managed to cope with um, speech uh, in a way that has allowed me to, uh, uh, to disguise uh, a speech uh, impediment. Uh, you'll often see me giving speeches, but not reading them. Uh, because if I can choose the, the vocabulary, I will naturally choose words that are easy to say. Uh, so uh, there's still some words and phrases you might avoid? Um, not many any longer. Um, if I'm speaking another language and giving sort of the opening of a speech, not Irish now, but if as a foreign minister, if I'm visiting a country, I'll often try to, to say something in a, in a foreign language and that, that can be a challenge. But in general, I've managed to almost completely deal with that issue and I often speak to to kids that have that have a stutter or a stammer parents sometimes email me about it and uh, you know I often say to them look you know I was exactly where you are when I was at your age I was hugely conscious of it socially as well as uh, academically um, but look at me now you know I'm on radio I'm on television mm -hmm. I'm you know leading debates in in the Dáil and the Shannad and um you know, you can make that transition too. And hopefully, um, particularly boys, it's, it's rare enough you get a girl that has a stammer. Um, this, is, this is predominantly a, a boy issue. And, uh, and it, it, it impacts on their self-confidence. Um, and, uh, and it's nice to give them a bit of encouragement that actually it doesn't always have to be that way. We said, uh, look at you now. Of course, in Northern Ireland, we know you mostly for foreign affairs, obviously yeah. Minister of Defence. Security Council role. I mean, just talk us through a typical week. I, I know that sitting here today, I mean, you've yeah. just, just come back from Somalia and Kenya. W what's in your intra in a given week? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we have this extraordinary privilege at the moment of being on the UN Security Council, which for me is kind of the ultimate in politics. You, you know, I've always been interested in international affairs, in justice issues internationally. Uh, when I was in the European Parliament, I was part of what's called the European People's Party group, who are seen as a sort of a conservative right of centre group. But I specifically went after being the human rights spokesperson for the European Parliament, because I don't cede that ground to people who describe themselves as left wing and sometimes see people who are sort of centre or perceived to be centre right as not caring about social issues and human rights issues and so on. And to my mind, nothing could be further from the truth. So. I've always gravitated towards those kind of issues. And, uh, and now, you know, to be one of 15 countries sitting around the table in the Security Council where literally war and peace issues are discussed is for me kind of the ultimate privilege for Ireland. And I intend on making an impact there. And I think we have done that. We've been there for six months now. We've been the most vocal country on the atrocities in Tigray in Ethiopia, which is one of the reasons why I was visiting the region in the last week. We have been very vocal in terms of Israel-Palestine uh, and the, uh, the violence uh, and conflict there, which was yet another round of senseless conflict because of bad politics. Um, we've been very vocal on women, peace and security. Uh, we are what's called the facilitator of the Iranian nuclear deal negotiation, which is about as difficult a negotiation as you can think of. Um, trying to put back together a nuclear deal that guarantees to the rest of the world that there will be rigorous and uh, transparent inspections within Iran and in return, removing some of the sanctions that apply to Iran. Um, again, that's, that's a job that we asked for and got. Um, we are what's called a pen holder in securing and ensuring humanitarian access into Syria 
Uh, there's about 13 million Syrians at the moment that rely on the international community to simply keep them fed and housed uh, and uh, with access to medicines and so on. Ireland and Norway are the two countries that have to try to guarantee that. And we have had a very difficult and challenging negotiation that has resulted in a successful um, maintaining of an international crossing through Turkey to provide uh, humanitarian assistance to about 3 million people in, in Idlib province. Um, uh, I, I visited there in January uh, to that crossing, which most people expected would close uh, it, uh, at the start of July because there was no agreement in the Security Council. We actually got unanimous support, which is almost unheard of, on a resolution on Syria. Uh, that involved Russia and the United States and China and France and the UK and you know the, the big member states. Um, that didn't happen by itself, but these are really challenging but really interesting briefs. Um, and of course, we we chair the expert working group on the Security Council on climate and security, which again is something that Ireland has been slow to be a world leader on, but now I think is a world leader on in terms of the legislation we're passing. The level of ambition in terms of reducing emissions in Ireland, which many people don't believe we can achieve, but I believe we can achieve by 2030 to reduce, to have the emissions, while at the same time allowing the economy to grow and our population to grow quite considerably in that period. So, you know, uh, for me, this is about how Ireland is seen in the world and how we use our wealth and our privilege and our influence to try to impact on decisions that can save lives, improve the quality of life for people, protect really vulnerable people, sometimes who don't have other people to speak up for them. Um, and you know that's why I was in Somalia in, uh, in Mogadishu this week, and I was in uh, both Nairobi and, and Mombasa in Kenya. We would have been going to Tigray and to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia as well, uh, because that country is on the verge of civil war, and there's 100 million people living in Ethiopia. It is a hugely important stabilizer in the Horn of Africa. And we all have a big responsibility to make sure that, that Ethiopia doesn't disintegrate as a country. And that could happen. And so uh, we are very involved in the Security Council in terms of trying to build a coalition to ensure that doesn't happen. So look, I hope this doesn't sound too sort of highbrow uh, or me trying to pretend that we're some kind of world changer or world beater, but we're on the Security Council. And for us, it's not just about being there. It's about really impacting as we can do, because Ireland has a special relationship with the United States. And they are the world's superpower. We have obviously good relations with both the British government and the French government. And that's three of the P5, the permanent five on the Security Council. And I have ensured that we maintain a, a functioning relationship also with China and Russia, uh, even though we don't agree with them necessarily in, in terms of many decisions that they make but we do have a respectful relationship and we need to if we're going to get things done on the Security Council. So this isn't for me about, you know, issuing the easy press releases, being on the sort of the, uh, the right side of every argument. If you want to be impactful on the Security Council, you've got to delve into the difficult, dirty areas as well. And you've got to build relationships and try to build um, compromises that can get agreement as opposed to, as I say, staying pure all of the time, but actually getting nothing done, which sometimes happens in the Security Council. Obviously, a lot of interest here in Israel and, and Palestine. Yeah. Um, back in May, you back to Sinn Féin motion describing what was happening. Uh, well, I changed, the, the, I, changed the Sinn Féin, I changed the Sinn Féin, I changed the Sinn Féin motion. Um, um, and which described it as de facto annexation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I agreed with that. Yeah. Um, and I just don't believe you can call it anything else if you're being honest. You know, but, the, but, but, but the, you also, at that, that time, criticised the Security Council for being too slow. To speak did, yeah. too, why, why were they so slow? Oh, look, I mean, you know, this isn't the first time that's happened. You know, the, the Security Council is highly political. And so in different conflicts, in different areas, uh, particularly the permanent five representatives who can veto decisions uh, on the Security Council, many of them have vested interests. They have alliances. They have commitments uh, politically that, that mean that they sometimes block uh, the council saying what needs to be said. And when that happens, I believe that a country like Ireland has an obligation to call it out. And I did. And I took some heat for that. But I make no apologies for it. And even if it's our friends who are potentially delaying or blocking a statement, we need to call it out. 
if we're to be respected as consistent. And you know, we know that the US were a very close ally of Israel, and I understand that relationship very well. Um, they were slow to, to allow a statement to come out of the Security Council that was tough, that was calling for an immediate ceasefire. And I felt that was wrong, and I said it. Doesn't mean that I don't have a good relationship with the United States, that I want to work closely with them on many files, but you know, if it was Russia, I'd be calling it out. If it was China, I'd be calling it out, if, it, if, if, if it's the US. And if Ireland wants to be consistent and credible on the Security Council, well then, uh, we've got to effectively apply international law as we see it. Um, and you know, that's how I approach the Israel-Palestine issue. There are many others who approach it emotionally, and I get that, by the way. But for me to be credible with both sides, I have got to call out what's happening in that relationship on the basis of international law, on the basis of Security Council resolutions. And that is why I repeatedly say settlements are illegal. The expansion of settlements are illegal. Um, the um, forced demolitions and forced evictions of people in their own land is illegal. You know, occupying powers in, in occupied territory have responsibilities under international law. Uh, and it's not that I'm anti-Israel. I'm not anti-Israel. But I'm certainly anti-Israeli government policy towards Palestinians in many ways. I'm also critical, by the way, of, uh, of you know, violence coming from the, from the Palestinian side. And one of the, one of the um, sorry, the amendment that I made to that, to that motion uh, was also to ensure that there was strong criticism of, of Hamas mm -hmm. um, and Sinn Féin wouldn't support that. But, but in the end, they, they, um, uh, they supported the overall amended motion, which, which is fair enough. Um, but, but for me, the, whether, whether you're positioning yourself on Israel-Palestine, which is something I'm passionate about, <laughs> I've been there many times in my life and I intend on going there again in September uh, or early October, uh, to, to try to speak to the new Israeli government and also, obviously, uh, to speak to the Palestinian Authority. Um, and we talk to them all the time. But, but, but whether it's Israel-Palestine, whether it's Tigray in Ethiopia, uh, whether it's uh, sanctions in Somalia, uh, whether it's humanitarian access into Syria, you know, our guiding star on the Security Council and on international policy has got to be international law and, uh, and UN resolutions. Uh, and that is, that is where Ireland derives its credibility. Just sticking with Israel-Palestine, do you think, Minister, are some countries afraid to criticise Israel because of the horrors of its past, because millions of Jews murdered, the Holocaust, other yeah. gen genocides were a period of centuries? Are perhaps some countries afraid to criticise Israeli policy? Yeah, yes, I think they are. Uh, and I think it is true to say that the greatest stain on humanity is the Holocaust, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it is unforgivable what happened to, to so many Jewish people and families uh, at that time. Uh, it was a systematic mass murder, uh, uh, a, an attempt to essentially uh, 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 you know, murder an entire race of people. Um, and that should never be forgotten in history. Um, um, and it isn't, I think. Um, having said that, uh, we also have to look at current conflicts today, and we have to look at them through the prism of international law. You can't justify something that's happening today because of an awful atrocity that happened in the past. Um, and so, you know, I often say, because I'm often accused internationally of being anti-Israel and, and pro-Palestinian. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I always respond to that by saying, I am pro uh, pa the Palestinian right to have a country and a land of their own. Um, but I'm also pro-Israel's right, of course, to exist, to defend itself, and to have its security guaranteed. But I am not pro the, the approach in recent years of the Israeli government, at times supported by the previous US administration, uh, in terms of how, Palesti how Palestinians are treated by, by an Israeli government that is breaking the law repeatedly in relation to, to that relationship. And, um, you know, I am also critical, as I always say, of, of, of violence on both sides. Um, but if there's going to be a peace process here that works, there's got to be a quality of esteem. <clears throat> and the starting point, in my view, has got to be that the end point has to be a two-state solution, two states living side by side with their security intact, um, facing down extremism and terrorism. 
uh, the international community has to help on that um, and has to recognize Israeli concerns in relation to that. But, you know, the idea that, um, that, that we progress that objective towards a peaceful, agreed future between Israel and Palestine, that that is helped by what's happening at the moment in the West Bank in particular around the, the scale and the strategic nature of settlement expansion and the infrastructure to facilitate that. Um, you got to call that out. And we do, and I do. Um, and uh, I hope I can have an honest relationship with this new Israeli government that's blunt, but that I, I hope I'm factually correct in terms of what I do. Um, uh, and that is how I try to, to behave. Uh, and some people don't like that. But I think if I'm consistent, then at least I'll be credible. Uh, and if you're not credible in, in the international community, it doesn't really matter what you say, to be you, honest. You, like, you, you, so you know, sir, I'm sure there's some critics who say that actually Ireland should have gone further, should have expelled <coughs> the Israeli ambassador. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah, you action, see, think, rather, action rather than words. Yeah, you see, I think that is really flawed thinking. Uh, I think that that thinking is about the politics of Ireland as it relates to Israel-Palestine, as opposed to actually trying to change for the better the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians. I mean, in my view, it would have been madness to, to expel the Israeli ambassador out of Dublin. We need to speak to Israel. We need to speak to the Israeli government um, so that they can hear our criticisms and our concerns. Um, and, you know, like expelling an Israeli ambassador might get 48 hours of headlines uh, and people might see that as some kind of moral advancement. But for me, uh, that's not what international politics, mature international politics is about. Um, we need to, I mean, if you're going to use that precedent, should we have expelled a dozen ambassadors out of Ireland, you know, for things that we don't agree with, uh, whether it's, you know, Hong Kong and Xinjiang in China, whether it's, you know, positions that, that have been taken in relation to Venezuela or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, real politics internationally allows you or should allow you to talk bluntly and honestly to people who you disagree with as well as obviously having a good relationship with, with people who have a very similar mindset to you. So, I mean, that's why I would have traveled to Tehran, for example. I got a lot of criticism for that. You know, people were asking the question there, are you somehow placating the regime in Tehran? No, I'm not. You know, but I am doing my job on the Security Council as, you know, as a facilitator for the Iranian nuclear deal. I need to be talking to people, just like my relationship with Sergei Lavrov in, in Russia. I don't agree with him on lots of things, but I need to have a relationship with him um, so that we can get things done. Um, and so for me, the relationship with the Israeli government is an important one. Um, we have difficult conversations at times, but it's important to be having those conversations. Otherwise, we're just talking to ourselves. And you know, that might go down well you know, in, in some quarters uh, in terms of domestic politics here, but do, does it change anything? Does it protect pa Palestinian interests? Um, uh, does it advance a peace process between Israel and Palestine? I don't think so. You, ma you mentioned again the Iranian nuclear deal and, and Ireland's role. Be, you must sometimes pinch yourself that our, a country the size of Ireland is involved in this kind of negotiation, facilitating a deal between superpowers, trying to encourage Iran to re-engage with, with that deal. Is anyone listening? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure too many people in Ireland are you know, are, 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 I mean, they're interested when they, when they read about it or hear about it, but people are getting on with their everyday lives. We're in the middle of a, well, hopefully towards the end of a pandemic. They have other things to worry about, you know. Um, I get that. Oh, the, uh, is the Iranian government but, listening? Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you talked about, like, do Irish people care? Um, the Iranian government, yes. So, you know, when I say that we're the facilitator of those talks, I don't want to give the impression that we are the sort of the fulcrum around, you know, mm -hmm. everything that functions. We're not. So the facilitator role effectively means that we bring an update to the Security Council on this file. Um, but linked to that, I felt it was important that I would agitate for the kind of change that we're looking for. That's why I went to Tehran. And within a few weeks, the Iranian foreign minister came to Dublin to follow up on that meeting. I do think that we contributed positively to getting Iran back into a negotiation in Vienna, which is where the negotiation takes place. And I think there is a good chance, despite the fact that there's been a pretty hardline Iranian president just elected, I still think there's a good chance that there will be an agreement between the United States and Iran and the European Union and, and other previous signatories to the, to the Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, there's a good chance that we'll get it back 
intact. Um, and Ireland has played its role in that. I don't want to overstate it, but as you say, you know, sometimes you do have to pinch yourself, actually. You know, when I was in Tehran meeting the, uh, the Iranian president uh, and then on to meet the foreign minister for three or four hours, going through the detail of what would allow them to come back into a negotiated situ- or a, a negotiating a situation. Yeah, like these are, I mean, look, this is why you're in politics, right? Um, for me, the reason I've committed my life to public life is because I want to, you know, look, like, like lots of politicians, I enjoy elections and I enjoy the debates and all the rest of it. But ultimately, for me, it's about changing things for the better. And that's why Northern Ireland, for me, is such unfinished business. Because the state of politics in Northern Ireland, the state of relationships in Northern Ireland, the tension between communities is, um, is as bad as it's been for a very long time. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm involved in that. And some would say I've contributed to that tension at times, particularly some people in the loyalist community. So for me, this is a big, big priority for the next, um, uh, for the next months and years to really try to rebuild relationships and be part of a debate around what the future holds for this island. Uh, because that really matters to me, I have to say. Um, you know, I have a number of very close friends who live in Northern Ireland, uh, particularly in Derry actually, um, but also in Belfast. And um, I'm determined to try to play a constructive role in, um, in a future for for young people who are growing up today in Belfast and Derry and other parts of Northern Ireland, um, so that they don't have to go through the the kind of uh, difficulties and tension and trauma that their parents have gone through. That leads us nicely into Northern Ireland, of course, which uh, we know you best for. Um, Brexit, protocol, Stormont, you get a new decade, new approach, now British government legacy plans. Enough to keep you, keep you busy. Yeah. Before moving on to detail, none of, none of that's easy, <laughs> to be honest. Um, How would you characterize the current relationship with our nearest neighbor? With, because over the years, it was always said that the peace process and politics work best when the British and Irish governments work together. Yeah. But the sense now is that they're not working together. Well, I mean, I think you need to make a distinction between the relationship between governments and the relationship between countries. So. I think the relationship between Britain and Ireland is still in a fairly positive space. You know, um, so many Irish people have family living across the UK. So many British people are living here. Um, And I think there's a lot of respect for the closeness of the relationship between Britain and Ireland, which of course is what makes some of the other things that we're trying to deal with so difficult to deal with um, because you're essentially negotiating with a friend, or certainly that should be the situation, but they are very difficult negotiations. Um, And there's a reason for that. You know, um, when the United Kingdom as a whole decided to vote for Brexit, you know, the response in Ireland and in the Irish government, and and I remember it very well, was, was a, really was, that something momentous had just happened and we were going to be right in the middle of trying to solve all of the problems that were going to flow from that uh, and it was not going to be easy. Um, And we knew that from day one. In fact, even before the referendum, we knew that if it went the wrong way, this was going to dominate Irish politics for quite a long time. Because the reason for that is that uh, the Good Friday Agreement the peace process in Northern Ireland is all about convergence. You know, it's about removing a border. It's about working together within the European Union to make sure that we create an all-island economy, which allows people to work together uh, and focus on relationships and business and agriculture and trade and selling things to each other and all of the things that that creates normal relationships. and North-South cooperation as part of that, um, uh, part of the institutions, essentially was about creating normality. And uh, when I say convergence, I don't mean sameness. I mean everybody working together under the same rules in the same union, i.e. the European Union, and therefore people having to focus a little less on the union of the United Kingdom versus the union that people, some people want 
in a reunified Ireland. Um, and the problem with Brexit is that it's all about divergence, which is the very opposite to the peace process. So it's about the United Kingdom saying, we're different. We're no longer part of the EU. It's, uh, it's regulation. Uh, it's um, facilitation of free movement of goods and services and people uh, uh, and everybody essentially aspiring to the same standards in, in, in all these areas. And so when you have a, a decision backed up by referendum to leave the European Union, to create separation and difference from the European Union as its objective, right? And then you actually marry that with a peace process, which is really about the opposite. So instead of focusing on borders, it wants essentially them to be largely, while there are political borders, of course, and constitutional borders there, it wants them to essentially be invisible. Um, Brexit forces uh, the opposite. Uh, and so, so for us, from day one is, you know, we were trying to think, how do we save and protect a peace process that involves North-South cooperation, an all-island economy, uh, relationships between East and West, when actually the United Kingdom wants to move in a different direction altogether. Um, and that is, that is why this was such a difficult issue to resolve. Now, some people just didn't want to hear at the start, you know, why is there a problem? Um, you know, that there's no big deal in, in terms of putting up technical border posts or we can do all this online. You know, it was fantasy stuff. We couldn't and we can't. Um, the rules of international trade require you to have trade borders if you have different regulatory models in two countries next door to each other. Um, and so, um, so the, the, the that, do, do you that has, I mean, that has created tension. I mean, there's no point in, yeah. do, but in, in do you understand otherwise. the unionist concerns, um, the unionist argument that the Irish Sea border threatens Northern Ireland's constitutional position, or do you think unionist politicians are, are using that as a negotiating ploy? No, but, well, no, but regardless of who they are, anybody who, makes, who, who solely focuses on the protocol, as if the protocol was plucked out of thin air, it's the problem and it needs to be fixed or removed, like, totally misses the context of where we are. You know, there is a reason why every former British Prime Minister uh, that's currently alive was uh, opposed the approach of the current British Prime Minister towards Brexit because they knew the tensions that it was going to create in Northern Ireland. You know, listen to um, Tony Blair, listen to um, uh, uh, John Major, uh, those two in particular, but also others, even, even Theresa May now in terms of you know, uh, expressing real concerns. Um, and so we had to try and find a mechanism that would limit the disruption of Brexit in, in a negative way. That's the protocol, right? So I know unionists keep saying to me, look, it infuriates us when you say Brexit's the problem, not the protocol, when they see the protocol as the problem. But effectively what they're saying is, we want things as they were before, and the protocol makes things different. The problem with that is Brexit doesn't allow us to go back to where we were before. Britain is no longer in the European Union. It's no longer in the customs union. It's no longer in the single market. And, 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 and so, given so, that, Minister, it's often said that within the European Union, the United Kingdom was Ireland's best friend within the yeah. EU. Is there anger that the UK has, has gone for Brexit? Is there, was there uh, anger within the Irish government that the sort of its best friend in Europe had, had walked away? Oh, I mean, there was, well, there was huge disappointment. But was there anger? And, and for us, no, I don't think it was anger. No, I mean, like we're way past that. Like the, 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 you know, I think we were a little shocked at the start because we knew what was coming down the tracks. Um, uh, and of course, Britain was divided down the middle. Like this idea that, you know, um, that there was only one view, Brexit must be delivered because that's the will of the people of the United Kingdom. Yes, a majority wanted, but a majority of people in Northern Ireland didn't want Brexit. A majority of people in Scotland did not want Brexit. It was a wafer thin majority that actually voted it through. And so, you know, our frustration was that, um, that the, the, uh, the approach to Brexit, um, rather than it being a sort of a one that tried to, to cater for both sides of the argument in the UK, which, which would have been a much softer Brexit, you know, instead it ended up being a much harder Brexit. Um, and that is because of the way in which politics, you know, 
rolled out during that period of time. Um, and in the end, within the Conservative Party, the hardliners um, uh, got their prime minister and hardened the position. And, you know, what we would have preferred was the United Kingdom outside of the EU, but in the single market with us. And in the absence of that, we would have liked the UK to be in the customs union with us. But in the absence of that, we wanted the UK to be treated as, as a whole, which was the backstop, but that was rejected too. And so all of these alternatives to the protocol got rejected by the British side, not the EU side or by the Irish government. We were, we were up for loads of other alternatives that, that, that wouldn't have had any checks in the Irish Sea. Um, but it was a British government's choice that the kind of Brexit that they wanted was separation from the EU, from a regulatory point of view, from a legal perspective, and so on. Okay, we respect that. But there needed to be a solution for Northern Ireland. And if it wasn't going to be a UK-wide solution, then it had to be Northern Ireland-specific, which was the choice of Prime Minister Boris Johnson to make, to make a, a specific, tailor-made solution for Northern Ireland, which... And, you know, the way in which the protocol is, is, is spoken of at the moment, and I have to push back hard on this, um, many people speak about the protocol as the EU imposing the protocol on Northern Ireland. The EU wanted a very different relationship with the UK, a much closer one that wouldn't have involved any borders, uh, tr trade borders, right? So, 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 so like, let's be very clear, and I know some people will, will bristle when I say this, uh, you know, from the unionist and loyalist community, the, the, the protocol as we see it today uh, was the result of a British government's choice in terms of the kind of Brexit that they wanted. And then they designed and agreed with us, when I say us, I'm talking about the European Union, obviously the Irish government and I was very involved in that. We had to try and design it then to minimize the disruption for everyone in Northern Ireland, to prevent border infrastructure on the island, to have no border infrastructure at all in terms of goods traveling from Northern Ireland into GB, which is completely unfettered. But the price of it was that there is some limited checks on goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland, because of course what the protocol is, is effectively extending the EU's single market for goods to Northern Ireland to prevent the need for any border infrastructure on the island. And that one price of Brexit for Northern Ireland around checks on, on goods coming into Northern Ireland because they may end up in the single market, uh, and the EU can't have a situation where there's a, an unguarded back door into the single market from GB. That one price is now the sole focus of debate, um, which I think kind of misses the whole point in some ways, that actually the main driver for disruption here was a democratic decision to leave the European Union, and then an interpretation of that decision coming in London from, from a Conservative party in government that they wanted a type of Brexit that forced a difficult but negotiated and agreed solution for Northern Ireland. What I want to do now, just to be clear, is even after that deal is done, you know, I'm not one of these people who says, you know, no, never, we can't change anything. Um, and I am probably the strongest advocate in Brussels with the European Commission, working with Vice President Sefcovic, who's the key person on the EU side, for as much flexibility as possible in terms of how that uh, protocol is implemented. You know, and I've been advocating around solutions on medicines, pets, uh, for an SBS and veterinary agreement that could reduce by 70 or 80% the number of checks in the ports of Larne and Belfast. Um, and we'll continue to advocate for that. But the British government's got to play their part. You know, the, the EU, I know in Westminster, is seen as, uh, as rigid and, and inflexible and so on. And we see, you know, media reports around, you know, medicines not being able to come into Northern Ireland. The EU has proposed a solution on medicines. And that's not even mentioned in the article. The EU has agreed to change EU legislation to ensure that there is no uh, interruption to the supply of medicines in, into Northern Ireland from GB. And that isn't even referred to because for some, um, the creation of tension around the protocol uh, uh, is part of a political strategy to force much more fundamental change on that protocol. And my job here, and this is the last thing I'll say, and I'm, and I'm talking a lot about the protocol, but as you can tell, I, I feel very strongly about it. My job here is to be honest with people, right? The protocol came about through a negotiated and agreed position on the British side, as well as the EU side. The protocol, since it was agreed, 
also then had agreed agreements subsequently last December on an implementation plan for the protocol. And since then, there's only one side compromising, and it's the EU side. So extension of, uh, you know, extensions of grace periods, um, and multiple flexibilities around different elements of the protocol that are problematic. You know, and I, I'm not one of these people who sort of says, well, look, suck it up and take it. There are elements of the protocol that we need to look at and we need to implement in a way that, is, that shows more flexibility, more pragmatism. Yeah. And, I, and I'm all for that. Um, but there's also a need for some honesty here on the British side, that this is not the, you know, this, this idea that this would all be fine if only the EU was more reasonable is just not a fair reflection of the facts on the ground. You've referred several times to tension. Um, some people view this as imposition by the European Union. Lordists and unionists um, have pointed a finger at yourself and at uh, Thomas yeah. Leo Varadkar. In many ways, you become a boogeyman for them. Um, do, at a personal, yeah. does that get under your skin? Does, does that annoy you? It doesn't get under my skin, but it is... I find it disappointing that people in the unionist community and loyalist community see me as the enemy, because I'm not. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a nationalist. I would love to see Ireland reunited uh, at some point in the future. I make no apologies for that, but I am also deeply conscious that there are many, many people uh, on this island, and in particular in Northern Ireland, who don't want that, who fear that, uh, who need reassurance and need to understand what that would mean for them and their lives, who feel that should that happen, they would be a minority who would be discriminated against. Um, and I have a real job to do to ensure that, um, that while, you know, I expect them to respect my perspectives, that they hopefully recognize that I respect theirs too, which is a very different version of history and a very different vision for what they want in the future. So, you know, for me, Britishness is part of this island. It's history. It's a painful, difficult history, violent at times. But the future has got to be one where British people in Ireland feel that this is their home and they're welcome here too, including if we can, can create a reunified island. Um, and, um, and that is something that I think we need to think deeply about. Uh, these ideas of for just calling for a border poll tomorrow or next week or next year without thinking that through fully, I just don't agree with that. And that's why I've said many times during the Brexit debates, when people have said to me, the answer to Brexit is a border poll and, uh, and Irish unity. I just think that um, I, I'm you, gonna, you know, like, like, it is just so much more complicated than that. I'm going to move on, Minister. This to, is primarily to, about relationships. Yeah, I'm going to move on um, to, to the, the border poll in the future. But yeah. before, before we do, if we can just sort of look back to the past, uh, yeah. legacy issues. Uh, yeah. The British government plans to uh, end prosecutions for troubles killings. You said earlier there's a need for honesty from the British government in terms of Brexit and the protocol. What is it about its position on legacy? and these proposals, because you will know the victims groups in Northern Ireland believe they are not being listened to. The yeah. political parties in Northern Ireland believe they aren't being listened to. They believe the British government is going to railroad this no matter what they say. Do you fear that's what's going to happen? I certainly hope that the British government doesn't railroad anything, because any time a government tries, tries to railroad something in the context of Northern Ireland, it, 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 it doesn't turn out very well. You know, I mean, when, when Northern Ireland is working, the British and Irish governments are generally working together too. Um, when Northern Ireland is working, the British and Irish governments are working to try to build consensus around contested space uh, and decisions. And for me, in some ways, legacy is the most emotive and difficult thing for people in Northern Ireland to deal with. And I'm very conscious that I talk about legacy from the comfort of living in Cork at the other end of the island. Um, and somebody who hasn't been in the middle of a you know, of a, of a riot or somebody breaking into my home and shooting at someone in my family or in the pub down the road. Uh, of course, I would have read about all of those things, um, but it hasn't scarred me in the way that it would have done for many people listening to this discussion. Um, and I am very conscious of that. But I also know from conversations with people in Northern Ireland what the centre ground opinion is on legacy. People want the truth, if they can get it. People want the, they want access to justice, 
in the courts if there is a um, if there's an evidence file that can allow them to do that. Uh, people want um, a structure around reconciliation that can allow people to contextualize the tragedy and the atrocities that they've lived through and look ahead to something different. Um, and so, you know, and I've said this publicly, while I, of course, am working with the Secretary of State on legacy to try and find consensus, um, I have a huge problem with the approach that the British government is proposing to take, uh, because what they're essentially saying is that the avenue for justice uh, through the courts in the context of a conviction uh, and a prosecution uh, will, will no longer be available. And instead, let's just focus on the truth and people telling their stories and move, move on on the back of that. I don't believe that's what will allow victims and their families to move on. Because, first of all, I don't believe we'll get to the truth. So any time we have got to the truth in relation to atrocities in Northern Ireland, it has involved investigations um, and most of the time um, it, it has involved a court system or a court-like system. So um, where people are forced to tell the truth under oath, uh, as opposed to some kind of voluntary process where people come and tell their stories. Um, so I believe there's a role for telling stories too, by the way. Um, but, but I think there has to be, for victims and their families, at least the possibility of a court system, a prosecution, uh, and a conviction. Um, and I think if we take that away from them, when so many families have waited for so many years to simply hear a judge say, this person has been convicted of murdering your loved one. Um, some have waited decades for that. And to simply legislate to say, well, sorry, that's now off the table. Um, I just think but, but you're, you're uh, the minister, is, you're, is more damaging than it is constructive in terms of the reconciliation road, which is difficult and it's long and it's painful. We all know that. And can I just say, by the way, a lot of families would have said to me, look, we know the chances of securing a conviction in relation to what happened to my family are very slim and it's very unlikely to happen. But they would also say, but don't take that possibility away from us. Um, and, you know, and also there's this thing of, you know, if somebody speaks out in a few years time or admits to an atrocity or a murder, the idea that actually the law couldn't follow up on that, you know, um, uh, you know, I think is, um, is also, you know, a big issue here. So for me, look, the other side of this argument is, like, we agreed an approach here on this issue. We agreed it back in 2014. The Stormont House Agreement was signed up to by the British and Irish governments and four of the five parties in Northern Ireland, with the exception of the UUP. Mm -hmm. um, so, but not implemented. But, but look, I mean, when I hear people saying, look, Stormont House isn't working, should we know that? Because nothing is, Stormont House isn't working because it's not implemented. We haven't passed legislation for it and we haven't put the structures in place. That's why it's not working. Not because it doesn't make sense, um, but, but if people have a problem with Stormont House or elements of it, let's talk about that. But for us, we're talking about it in the context of, you know, I, I find it hard to believe that I could be convinced by arguments made by anybody that actually the way forward for Northern Ireland on legacy is to simply legislate for a, um, well, what people will see as, as an amnesty. Um, and, and then expect that everyone will just sort of accept that and suck it up and, uh, and just go about their business. I mean, look, the truth here is that, you know, there are, there are a number of drivers here in terms of this policy. Um, and well, I, well, as you know, Minister, ministers would say that the big driver here is British military veterans, that this is veteran centred. Yeah and not victim-centred. And that's the only consistency the British government currently cares about. Well, I think that is obviously a concern of many victims. Um, you know, that the debate is being led by Westminster, not by Northern Ireland. And that is no way to deal with legacy. So, you know, I respect the British government's um, right to have a different perspective here. Uh, I know that the debates in Westminster have been very contentious in this space, um, in terms of whether or not the rule of law should apply equally to 
to veterans as to um, paramilitaries in Northern Ireland who committed some awful atrocities. Um, but, you know, our view on this, a, a bit like the conversation we had earlier, is if we're to be credible here, we apply the rule of law equally to everybody. Doesn't matter whether you're wearing your uniform or whether you're not. Doesn't matter whether you have a label as a terrorist or a paramilitary, uh, or whether you have a, a badge that you know means you're part of the British Army or the, the police service in Northern Ireland or the RUC previously. You know, it's the it's the act. Was there a murder? Was there an atrocity? Uh, was somebody breaking the law? That is what has got to determine. Uh, how we respond to these issues. And, and if we don't do that, well, then we're categorizing different communities in different ways. Um, and uh, I remember Karen Bradley, when she was a Secretary of State, she almost lost her job over this issue when, when she said something in, in Northern Ireland which essentially made a distinction between... Uh, oh, so uh, she said soldiers hadn't committed murder. Yeah, Basically, yeah, all the killings yeah, have been lawful. Yeah. And she apologized for that uh, and worked hard to try to sort of rebuild credibility with victims groups and so on. Like, the British government is proposing to go way beyond that now. You know, um, but, and, but, and, but, and but, uh, this whole ministry you've you referred to, you, you need a, a partnership, a working partnership with the British government. The British government were well aware of your position, well aware of victims' positions yeah. and politicians w- long before they announced these proposals. What did Brandon Lewis and Boris Johnson do? Just plow ahead and they decide we're doing this in matter what you say. How big a breach would that be in the relations between the two governments? Well, I mean, can I just say, first of all, Brandon Lewis and Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the British government are perfectly entitled to bring forward new approaches, new proposals. That's how politics works, you know, and so that's not what I have a problem with. Um, my, my issue here is that's their proposal. Our position for now is the Stormont House Agreement, which we think could work if implemented. Um, but we're going to work over the next few weeks to see whether we can whether we can talk to victims groups, political parties, the British government to see if we can build some consensus around uh, a, um, uh, amendments perhaps to Stormont House, if that's the right thing to do, if we can achieve consensus around it. But my objective here at the end of this process is to try to find a way forward that not everybody you know, will be enthusiastic about per se, but everybody could live with. You know, so that we can move the legacy issue forward on the basis of some level of consensus. And of course, I'm willing to change my views if, if, if it achieves that. Um, but I find it very hard to see how a statute of limitations, or what many will regard as an amnesty, uh, uh, can ever achieve consensus in Northern Ireland. So for me, this is a debate that should not be built around promises and or debates in Westminster or in Dublin for that matter. This has got to be based on what's good for Northern Ireland, what's good for Northern Ireland society, what's good for victims, and there are thousands of them, Um, um, not just in terms of murders, but also people who were injured as well, probably 40,000 people in Northern Ireland um, in terms of of injuries during the Troubles. Um, And, you know, they're the people that matter here most. And we've got to try and find a way forward for them that allows, like some families don't want to go to a court system. They just don't want to go through it all again. And they want, they want the truth through different mechanisms. Some people just want to move on. Um, um, and, but there are others who, who feel that justice for their loved ones has got to at least be possible. Um, should, should the evidence file change or should there be more evidence made available and so on. And we know, by the way, that evidence files do change in Northern Ireland. People do come forward and speak. Um, And of course, we have a number of files that the Irish government has been asking for for many, many years uh, in relation to Dublin Monaghan, for example, that we haven't actually got uh, a return on. So are are you concerned that this process... There are many, there are many, you know, there are many chapters that are not yet written in relation to the legacy journey. And for us, the most important thing here is to listen to everybody and try to support a position that can achieve as much consensus as possible. And I hope that if we do that, that the British government will respond to that in a way that is generous and is Northern Ireland focused, as opposed to focused on 
uh, a, a commitment that was made in, a, in an election manifesto or okay. uh, statements that were made in the House of Commons and so on. That shouldn't be the main driver here. I would just, and, and, I would and just and briefly, briefly fair, pick up Minister on, sorry, on Dublin yeah. Mullen. You a concern from the Irish government's point of view that this could impact on that investigation because those perpetrators, if they're in Northern Ireland, this would stop any investigation by the PSNI. Well, look, I mean, we have concerns around all of the legacy cases um, uh, because, of course, the, 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 the statute of limitations that's being proposed applies not only to criminal prosecution but, but to civil as well cases. Um, can I say, though, we have an obligation in the Irish government to make sure that that we make a persuasive case too in terms of atrocities that, that may have a cross-border element uh-huh. to them uh, in terms of investigations. And let me just put on the record, I am open to, uh, to, to any form of cross-border cooperation uh, in the context of both establishing the truth and securing justice for families and victims. Um, that's not easy politically to do. Um, and you know we have already legislated in the last number of years to allow Angarda Chiacana to contribute to inquests in Northern Ireland, which is you know in a different legal jurisdiction, um, which I think might be a first in terms of mm-hmm. international law. So we're willing, but we're willing to do more in but that space. Joint investigative if it, teams. If it if it can if it can achieve consensus around how we deal with legacy, I'm willing to go a long way down that road. Um, and. Uh, but but let's let's hear what parties have to say, um, and um, you know I certainly have my team very much focused on working through the summer on this issue, and hopefully um, Brandon Lewis and I, working with political leaders and victims groups and families, can find a way forward that doesn't involve um, any one government forcing the issue or legislating against the wishes of the majority of people in Northern Ireland. And just uh, finally and briefly on the legacy issue. Um, some critics have characterised the British government's approach as bordering on reckless. How would you characterise it? I mean, I don't think it's it's helpful for me to get into that space of sort of having a go at somebody. Um, my job is to try to get an outcome here for families, uh, to try to work with a Secretary of State that I have good time for. And, you know, we have a, a good relationship, even though it's robust at times, because, you know, we have, we have a, we, we both have jobs to do and so on. Um, and likewise, my relationship with party leaders in Northern Ireland, you, you know, it's not helpful for me to, you know, be having a go at someone in the media or, or, or describing things in an emotive way. The only thing that matters here on legacy for me is an outcome that achieves as much consensus as possible that then delivers in as, you know, reasonable a timeline as possible, as much truth, and as much justice uh, as we move on a road to reconciliation, that ultimately like, that's what this is all about, so that um, communities in Northern Ireland can live together in less tension uh, and a more peaceful and neighbourly environment. And uh, but the problem for us at the moment is the combination of tension on legacy, tension on the protocol, uh, political tension uh, between parties. Um, tension around COVID and its management, which has put everybody under pressure. Um, All of these things together um, have created an atmosphere in Northern Ireland where, you know, some people are demonizing me. I'm sure there are some people in in certain communities that are demonizing the Secretary of State as well, or Prime Minister Johnson or um, Leo Varadkar, you know, and ultimately here, as senior politicians, we have to find a way of making decisions that allow life in Northern Ireland to be a little bit easier. And that's why my commitment to the unionist community in Northern Ireland, who have a huge problem with the protocol, is to try to be as flexible and as pragmatic as we can be, but also to be honest with them. And just this pretense that we just do away with the whole thing, and sure, shouldn't have been there anyway. Uh, And that what follows then is not going to be significantly more disruptive than the protocol. It's just not true. So, so we have to try and find a way of implementing what's been agreed, which of course is international law, by the way, <laughs> like so that the minor issue of signing up to an international treaty that was the withdrawal agreement that, that had the protocol as part of it, implementing international law, but doing it in a way that does recognize that this is not easy for Northern Ireland and we've got to deal with the disruption uh, in terms of trade coming from 
um, from east to west, in other words, GB into Northern Ireland. Um, if we just um, finish looking forward, you mentioned earlier the border poll, a debate that's been accelerated by Brexit and by the, the protocol. Um, your party colleague, Leo Radker, said recently he believes there'll be a United Ireland within his lifetime. Uh, teacher of Michal Martin has shared Ireland approach as a more softly, softly approach. What's your position? I know, I mean, I, I think, I think Leo Radker articulated well what he thinks the sequence of events should be. Um, and I think there was a lot of unfair headlines around what he said. I think partly that was timing, you know, because it was a very tense week mm -hmm. politically anyway that week on other issues, particularly the protocol. Um, but what Leo was, what was essentially saying, and we have spent a lot of time talking about this together. Um, um, you, you know, the first thing we need to do is we need to build relationships that allow people to start trusting each other again. The second thing we need to do is, by doing that, we need to protect the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. Because without those institutions and that foundation, we're in a very difficult place. And the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are not functioning as they should. You know, um, and uh, whether that's you know, British-Irish intergovernmental conferences, whether it's North-South ministerial meetings, um, whether it's you know, our, as an Irish government, you know, a proper respecting of the strands, within the Good Friday Agreement, but at the same time actually working with ministers in the executive to, to make things happen on the basis of commitments we've made and New Decade New Approach and so on. Um, you, you know, we've got to rebuild a, a, a level of trust and respect and understanding of, of each other's perspectives. Um, I think before we, we are gonna be able to take on the complexity and challenge of a debate around you know, the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Uh, I think to do it the other way around, which is what a lot of people are advocating for, you know, get on with the border poll now, uh, we can win it. And as soon as we get 50% plus one, we'll force it through. Like, I just think that we need less aggression in Northern Ireland and we need more thoughtful um, contribution in this area. My party is working hard, quietly, to try to, to think about how we could give some leadership in that area um, uh, over the next few years. Uh, but for me, we've got to settle the issues on the protocol. We've got to settle the issues on legacy. Uh, we've got to make sure that the executive can have an election, get through an election, get out the other side and reform a functioning executive and assembly after next May's elections. Um, these are big challenges that impact on everyday life in Northern Ireland. And we have to, I think, work on those basics and strengthen them, but at the same time, not shy away from the other conversations that need to take place. Because the, there, is, there is this view that, you know, if somebody like me or Leo Varadkar expresses a view that we would like to one day see the reunification of Ireland, that somehow that's a totally unacceptable, provocative thing to say, uh, and that somehow we're associated with you know, violence in the past or something just because we've said that. Yet at the same time for a British government minister or a unionist leader to give a speech about protecting the union, which happens every day, is perfectly okay. Like, that's not okay. You know, it, it, it is of course okay for unionists to talk about why being part of the United Kingdom is in the interests of Northern Ireland and in their interests. But it has to be equally okay for nationalists to speak as publicly and as openly about what they want and, and why they believe that their vision for the future of this island as a whole is a, is a positive one. And the problem with it is that um, the calls for a border poll tend to get associated with, you know, other issues that, that entrench people. Um, and I hope we can get to a point through the kind of sequencing that I'm talking about, protecting the institutions, rebuilding relationships, having more certainty around politics in Northern Ireland for now will allow us then to take on these bigger questions. Uh, because look, you know, ultimately this is, this is a political choice for people in Northern Ireland. You know, what, this what isn't, this isn't, this isn't for, the uh, choice of an Irish government or quite frankly, a British government either. Like the Good Friday Agreement requires a Secretary of State if he or she believes that, that there is a, uh, a majority of people that, that 
are seeking constitutional change to then plan for, uh, for testing that with a border poll, north and south, by the way. Um, that is, so this is a choice under the Good Friday Agreement and its structures for the people of Northern Ireland and for the people, by the way, south of the border too. Um, so, um, but, um, and clearly the, the margins around what people want for the future are much narrower now. Like, there is no majority for anything in Northern Ireland right now. Um, everyone is a minority, uh, just different sizes of minorities. Uh, and so we have to get, be able to get into a space where we can have those conversations in a way that, are, that is a lot more respectful and less threatening and therefore less offensive to people than it is at the moment. And, you know... Well, I tell you what, in terms of those discussions about proposed citizens' assembly, Sinn Féin and the SDLP have talked about it recently. Uh, what about that as an idea in terms of getting that discussion underway? Yeah, so, I mean, we, in some ways, we're kind of... We're kind of doing some of that with the um, with the shared island unit, which you know I'm very involved in. Of course, the teachers very involved in it as well. You know, we've had a number of really good sessions in the shared island unit talking about the future of the island, uh, in the context of environment and climate, in the context of youth, in the, in the context of civil society. Uh, there's going to be ones on education, on business opportunities as well. So, this is about what I talked about earlier: trying to build relationships as opposed to going straight to the to the uh, uh, to the border poll question, um, and um, and that's why the shared island unit is about relationships, not about border polls. Um, what what people are are asking me to to do on a uh, you know in terms of some sort of civic forum around reunification, I think that only works if there's unionist involvement. Sure, otherwise, we're talking to ourselves, you know, uh, you know, on the nationalist side. So, you know, if you have um, views coming from south of the border and north of the border from the nationalist community. But it doesn't mean that unions can effectively veto no, it by refusing no. to take part. Yeah, no, they could. But you have to ask yourself the question, are you actually getting a full understanding of the issues on something as fundamental as constitutional change on the island if there isn't unionist input? You're not. So let's just be honest about that. Whether or not we should be talking uh, um, uh, in some kind of civic forum around some of these issues, knowing that that we're missing a big perspective in the discussion, you know, I mean, I don't want to say no, never to that. I mean, um, maybe that is worthwhile. But I think, you know, if you look at what the Shared Island Unit is doing at the moment, it is reaching out to unionist communities. Unionist political parties aren't supportive of it. But many in unionist communities have been involved in those dialogues, and it's been really quite challenging and quite interesting. So, um, you know, yes, there will be a point in the future where I think there is a need for some civic forum, hopefully, uh, that can attract unionists to be part of that discussion. Um, but, but for now, I think, you know, some of the issues that I mentioned earlier around protecting institutions, rebuilding relationships, rebuilding trust. Um, and also improving the relationship between Dublin and London, quite frankly, in relation to, to some of these issues as well. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to do there in the short term. And just finally, Minister, then on the border poll, some would like it immediately. You've made it clear you wouldn't. Someone said five years, ten years. What is a realistic time scale, or is it a case of how long is a piece of string? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think, um, I think the people in Northern Ireland will decide that. I mean... It's far, like, far be it from me to say, you know, to name a date. I mean, I saw, for example, you know, Bertie Hearn named a date in the, you know, in the late 2020s. Uh, other people have, have tried to put timelines and so on about it. I mean, I think, first of all, we have to understand what will the choice be? And if they were to vote yes, what would that look like? So, like, if we've learned anything from Brexit, you don't ask the question first and then think about it afterwards in terms of, dealing with the consequences of a decision of that magnitude. You've got to understand first, what's the choice? So Northern Ireland staying as it is now, uh, presumably with a a unionist vision about how it can be uh, more integrated into the United Kingdom in a way that improves people's quality of life, or a reunification of Ireland, um, which, you know, I, uh, you know, want to work on. Um, uh, in terms of trying to build as positive a, a vision around that as possible for
for unionists as well as nationalists, as well as other people who don't regard themselves as either, by the way, in Northern Ireland, and there are many of those. Um, and so, so I think we need to make sure that, that we are exploring what we actually mean by this question in terms of the impact on people's lives and opportunities and so on. That's what needs to happen first. Um, and it'll be people in Northern Ireland because they're opinion polled all the time on this issue. We'll see ourselves when people in Northern Ireland are persuaded by those arguments. And that will de determine the timeline. But, you know, I, 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 think, um, I think we're not likely to see it, you know, this year or next year or in, you know, between now and the next general election in Ireland. But, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, politics is volatile in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think a lot of people are starting to think about this question in a way that they mightn't have been in the past. I think Brexit has contributed to that, whether we like it or not. Um, the real challenge for people like me is, how do we contain the tension of that discussion in a way that maintains peace and stability and some trust between communities and political leaders, while at the same time not shying away from the debate in the first place, which I certainly won't. Minister Simon Coveney, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.